Before we get started, I want everybody outside in my car. I'm taking you for ice cream. Well, as it turns out, my car fumbled the drive shaft. Looks like one of the clamps that holds the U-joint to the rear differential just up and gave up the ghost. Probably my fault for putting 10,000 people in my car. What do you say? Rain check on the ice cream? And in other bad news, the old TIG welder is gone. Breaking up is hard to do. Next on the chopping block, the MIG welder. Though, to be honest, I'm undecided if I should sell it or put it in an ice-filled bathtub to harvest its organs for a DIY cold wire feeder for the TIG. Now that'd be hot. I mean cold. I have nothing against MIG welding. The floor space is much more valuable to me than an old welder I might use, I don't know, once a year. And once I get this thing out of here, I can build a new tricked-out cart for the HTP. It'll be a slim window, of course, so I'll have to move fast. As soon as you create floor space, a sort of gravity well starts to form. Scrap metal, old shoes, and kids' toys will slowly start to migrate here in an attempt to fill the void and restore balance. But dealing with gravity wells is outside the scope of this video. We'll cover that later in Advanced Topics for Home Gamers, where I'll also explain the physics of why the power feed on your lathe and mill increases exponentially the further you try to get away from a running machine. Anyway, I'm doing a little housekeeping. I've really accumulated a lot of carp over the years. I did give away some stuff with that old TIG welder, headaches mostly, and I'm trying to figure out what I want hanging on a new TIG welding cart. This, for example, is an old 26 size torch. These things are absolutely divine for driving 10 stakes, clubbing seals, and welding to 200 amps without the hassle of a water cooler. I hope not to need this anymore, but I think I'll keep it around on the off chance the welder might have to leave the shop. I'm also the proud curator of a Binzel or Euro-style torch boneyard. I think I'm going to throw all this stuff away. In my experience, these are made pretty cheap. The rubber or copper or I don't know what goes, and it just turns into a sloppy, mushy torch. The buttons are cheap. I don't think I've ever really had problems with them on TIG torches. MIG torches, I've been through a few, but that's a different story. They're easy enough to fix. These seem to be really popular on the import machines. Now, I'm no expert, but I consider this more of like a maintenance torch. Like it's on that box that just gets slung over your shoulder up top of the ladder. Can't really use a pedal, that kind of thing. I mean, you can use a pedal with these, but I think they're meant to be autonomous. But in a shop environment where you're usually welding at a bench, you know, where you can get comfortable, I never really liked these things. But, you know, personal preference. So while I was sorting through this stuff anyway, I thought it might be of interest to share thoughts on these two puppies, the CK80 and the Flexlock. Now, I never really found the sort of information I was looking for before I bought mine, so here we are. Consider this a public service announcement. This is not a test. So I used to do a lot more welding than I currently do. That stuff I showed you moments ago has seen some heavy use and some hard times. Though how I ended up with this stuff in particular is a long and complicated story that involves bad purchases, store credit, and with some blame going to those holy smokes we thought we'd sell way more of these mailers that you get from time to time. Though I will confess, in my younger years, I was art supply curious. After my friends and I would hit the comic book and music shops at the mall, after watching one or two airbrushed t-shirts come to life, I'd be the one to inevitably drag them to the art supply store where I'd manhandle all the pens, brushes, and exacto knives they had on display. While my friends tried to look their darndest hanging around outside a store called the Limp Brush or something, of course looking radical in their style and high tops and popped collars. Which is to say I may possess some recessive gene that's screwing with my wallet. But fun fact, sometimes it's cheaper to buy just the replacement heads than it is a whole new torch kit. If you're looking to try a different torch and maybe have no one around that owns that torch you think you'd like to try, replacement parts may be an easier way in. The CK80, for example, would set you back about 100 clams if you bought the torch package. If you buy just the head, it costs about 30 bucks, and maybe another few bucks for some of these weird size ceramic nozzles. I already had the hose and handle from a 17 size air cool torch, so I only really needed the head. But I did have to make my own adapter to fit it to the CK torch, so keep that in mind. The 80 is an air cooled torch and good to, well, 80 amps. The obvious benefit to this torch is that it's small. For reference, here it is next to a quarter. 
And let me see if there isn't something I can do for my viewers with metric proclivities. Huh. You know, I never really noticed that. It looks like the Canadian version of the CK80 is actually small. Every time I've come across something tight that required getting, let's say, creative with a regular torch, or resorting to one of these laparoscopic anteater nozzles, I'd find myself wishing I had something like this 80 size torch. And when I finally did buy it, a miraculous thing happened. None of my neighbors or my father-in-law have broken a single thing that would require a slimmed down torch. Isn't that crazy how the universe works? So this is obviously a specialty torch designed to get into tight places, but that doesn't mean it only works in tight places. I mean, it's extremely light on its feet. Paired with a super flex cable, this thing really does feel like writing with a pen. But again, it's only 80 amps, so it likely doesn't cover your welder's complete range, but I don't know what you weld. Then again, if you just blew an entire Saturday morning fixing someone else's oil pan, the part is probably already a thousand degrees, your gloves have permanently bonded to your skin, and your helmet has liquefied on your face. So 80 amps is likely plenty to get down into that deep dark section with your dying breath to rebuild that last piece of threaded area you just couldn't reach before. Sure, now you're dead and the bum still won't pay up, but boy he really appreciates you helping him out. The torch components are all front mount on the CK80. There is no back cap. It uses the cutest little baby collets and collet closers you've ever seen that you tighten from the front side, from the outside. I'm going to guess there's probably a special tool to tighten these collets from the outside, but I don't have it. There's a hex on the front end. Maybe if you have a small nut driver, that could work. I think that size nut driver probably doesn't have a hollow shaft to accommodate the stick out of your tungsten. But usually I'll assemble the components, take a good guess on the stick out, test fit the cup on, you know, maybe move the tungsten a bit, and then when I'm happy, remove the cup and tighten the collet. And speaking of which, if you haven't noticed, they don't take very much tungsten at all. Maybe an inch, three quarters of an inch. I suppose they're good for using short bits that you can't hold on to anymore in your regular torch. But if you're new to TIG welding, and you're still quite not sure just how often you should be dipping your tungsten into the molten weld puddle, you might want to hold off on this one. As you see, there's not a lot of electrode to work with. You could potentially go through a heck of a lot of it with a torch like this. So, 30 40 bucks having this in your toolkit, you know, in case you need it. For me, I thought it was worth it. The other torch I've always been curious about, and never found anyone who actually owned one for me to try, is the Flex Lock. Now, I'm sure you've seen this torch it has the swivel head and what seem to be some well thought out angles so you can spin it and lock it in the position you need, which consequently is always different than the position you end up using. Now, this was a total splurge. Absolutely no justification other than really wanting to try it. I played around with this a bit, but its first real use came with the go-kart build. There, it really shined. Was it necessary? Absolutely not. But it was convenient not having to flip the frame around or having to weld left-handed. It's air-cooled, and this happens to be the 150 amp head. The FL150, I think they call it, equivalent to a 17 size torch. Now, from what I understand, the torch body on these is the same, so you can install a 17 size or a 9 size head. Once you buy into the system, you can easily swap different size heads for the work at hand. Though, one thing I didn't quite get about these, and probably my biggest beef with the torch, is the little lock screw to position the head. I didn't really know this at the time of purchase, and it's not really that big of a deal, but these little screws are considered consumables, just like your collets and cups. With not much use at all, I'd managed to already make it to the second lock screw. Here's the original that came with the torch. Just fell off, really. And no, I didn't get it too close to the work. It didn't touch any hot metal. I may have tried to adjust the head while it was hot, though. That probably pushed it over the edge. I was a little more careful with this screw during the cart build, but there it never really got past, I don't know, 100 amps. But I think if you're careful with it and not always chimping around while you're welding, it probably lasts a reasonable amount of time. With my limited experience, I don't think I'm going to run this 150 head past 120, maybe 130 amps. At 130 amps, it didn't take this head very long to become uncomfortable to hold. Now, I'm sure it works just fine up to 150 if you don't abuse the head and screw. I think I tend to trust CK. I just found that at higher amperages for longer welds, it just wasn't very comfortable. I've also found there's a bit of a trick to locking the head. I mean, the screw is small, which is good for keeping bulk down, but not great for tightening. I found that instead, using the head for leverage works much better. So if you want the torch, say, straight, you set the torch maybe an eighth of a turn shy of where you need it, 
snug up the screw, and bring it in with the head itself. And there, it's pretty rock solid. When I started with this, I did find the head at times loosening on me. Like if you're not aware of which way you're pushing with the torch, maybe sometimes while you're welding, you might rest the cup, end up pushing a little harder maybe than you wanted to, coming around a corner, and it would, of course I can't get it loosen up on me. But with use and care, it's turned out to be a very convenient torch. I would be a little more mindful of how you handle this than you would with a, you know, a single piece, a regular torch, maybe throwing all your stuff into the back of a truck or something. I don't think you have to babysit it, but with a little care, I'm sure it lasts a long time. I've never tried that, but it looks like it goes on upside down too. What I'd really like to try, but can't justify, is the water-cooled version of the nine-sized flex lock. Maybe I'll put together some of this extra stuff I have, put it on eBay, and get together enough change to make that upgrade. The spec sheet says they're good to 230 amps in both AC and DC. Again, that's the nine size, the smaller size, and I think would be a perfect fit for my HTP 221. It's a 220 amp machine. Anecdotal evidence from the internet seems to point to the melting lock screw not being as big of a problem, and that the head's not getting as hot, consequently then being more comfortable to use. In the water-cooled versions of these, the water never actually makes it into the head because of the way the flex lock system works. It just circulates through the body and back. But I guess if you're moving enough cold water through there, it could still sink that heat efficiently, hopefully performing like a regular water-cooled torch. Again, I assume CK did their math. Now, all that said, and because I know someone will ask, my favorite torch so far is the water-cooled 9. Now, I spent a lot of time and money avoiding water cooling and regret every cent of it. Right now, I'm using city water and no water cooler. I've got a copper pipe running pretty much right over my bench. I simply cut into it and installed a T-fitting. Now, for the amount of water these things use, you could probably use one of those self-piercing needle valves they use for plumbing and refrigerators or ice makers. That'd probably be pretty easy, but personally, I like to sweat the small stuff. <clears throat> And once it's through the torch, it drains to a rain water tank we have outside. See, my welding is in fits and starts. I don't do this for a living, so I don't feel too bad about wasting that water. But then again, you know, I'm not using power running a cooler. Not sure how that trade-off works exactly, though. I avoided water cooling for so long, partially because of the hassle of the whole water setup, whether that's a cooler or running city water, and a little because I didn't like the thought of having to drag around three cables. But as it turns out, I was wrong. This, for me, is a much more comfortable setup. The hoses are still very flexible. The torch is really small. It stays very cool, and it's just a pleasure to use. Again, just to clarify, an air-cooled torch of this size couldn't handle the entire amperage range of my 221. This gives me a very light and very comfortable single torch setup for the entire amperage range. And between this and Jody's engagement ring, I think I could go weld on the sun. Though I do plan to build a water cooler one of these days. In fact, I've been collecting parts for years. I'm up to two. My personal gripe with commercial coolers, unless you buy something really high end, is that they're usually pretty noisy. When I'm out here in my garage, I quite enjoy my peace and quiet. I can tell you the HTP welder is incredibly quiet. Adding a noisy cooler would be a crime, quite frankly. Now, I don't know if I can make my cooler quiet, but I'm sure gonna try. As an intermediate step, before a full-fledged cooler build, I think I'd like to add a solenoid to the water line so the water is only running when the welder is on. More precisely, to ensure the water is running when the welder is on. I plan to power both the welder and the solenoid with a common switch. Maybe something like this. I'm not sure if the amp rating is sufficient. As it is right now, I have to remember to manually turn the water on and off before and after welding, and I have had one or two close calls. These things will burn up in a heartbeat without any water running through them. I should also mention that city water isn't great for TIG torches. Personally, I think it's the fluoride. There are very small water passages in here that can clog and consequently destroy your torch. Well, that's it for now, I think. I'm going to try to sort through the rest of this junk. Like I said, do some house cleaning, but thought I'd share. Oh, and if you were wondering why during this video you only ever saw just two of my hands, it's because while making this video, I was simultaneously repairing my Jeep. Thanks for watching.